there was a great question earlier of how do we manage costs, but in order to manage costs, we have to understand what's going on. So I'm going to have my colleague, Dr. Devinder Prasad, take over. Continue with the same, like now moving on to the pathophysiology of fit LIGO. So, Devinder, what factors are involved in the pathophysiology of vitiligo? Yeah, vitiligo is a complex disorder with multiple factors, it's a polygenic, multiple genetic risk factors. There's so many triggering agents, oxidative stress we have in morning. Uh, talk by Dr. Mauro Picardo. So all of these uh, factors, they contribute to uh, melanocyte destruction, what we call as vitiligo. Uh, this, like, uh, this could be certain other melanocyte defects, like melanocytorrhizae, put forward by Dr. Gauthier, initial morph some other clinical morphologic morphological defects, which can contribute. Uh, probably now this is, uh, as I say, it's a very exciting phase. The things are falling in place, and we have now some of uh, uh, like understanding how these melanocytes are being getting destroyed. But initially, maybe uh, 20 years back, there was discordance between clinicians versus uh, this immunologist. They have because they are thinking that this is just a one cause for vitiligo, that is autoimmunity, and there are these other factors might be giving rise to depigmentation, which might not be called at this vitiligo. But now, they, as we will be discussing, uh, probably some more of convergence and how these different factors contribute towards uh, making this pathway that we will be discussing. So this Richard Spritz group has done a lot of work on uh, genetics of vitiligo, so many good Jiva studies, especially in mostly in Caucasian skin in European and uh, American population, although we are lacking here our data about the Indian. But most of these uh, uh, protein in course for the material which are through that immunoregulatory genes only points toward in that direction, although there are some like uh, apoptotic pathways and melanogenesis are also involved. But according to Richard Spritz, like he says that, I mean, he has dissected almost 99.9% .9 of information of genetic risk of vitiligo. But we are looking forward to any clinical translation of this knowledge. How this genetic risk, what uh, how we can translate into its clinical implication, that's I think uh, we, uh, it's uh, still uh, far away. So Devinder, if you looked at that map, would you say that vitiligo is an autoimmune disease based upon the gene profiles or not? Yeah, so this is a direct question, so uh, that is what I was mentioning to the discordance, but ultimately the major pathway we know is an autoimmune pathway. But what could be the triggering factors and how these certain melanocyte effects like melanocytorrhizae, oxidative stress, that uh, metabolism, uh, like tetrahydrobiotarin, leading rise to more of oxidative stress. So all these factors have shown there are studies that contributing towards uh, ultimate uh, disappearance of melanocyte from the patch. But yes, huge data on autoimmune, so we tend to say like this an autoimmune disease, yes. So this is uh, data on androgenous and exogenous stimuli contributing to the overproduction of reactive oxygen species. So Dr. Mauro Picardo has done a lot of work. So in the morning we had discussion the role of antioxidant. As a clinicians, we are more interested to know about what is the implication of this understanding of, because there is a huge, again, in vitro data as seen in this slide, uh, oxidative stress is there. So now if we tackle this oxidative stress with antioxidant, and we need to have some, as discussed in the morning, better design studies, evidence-based study to assess the role of antioxidant in the management of vitiligo. I think this area also needs some work here. So this oxidative stress in melanocyte causes several 
changes potentially which can contribute. So this probably would uh, answer the question how these can be interlinked together, like oxidative stress giving rise to uh, maybe a starting step for me uh, for the immune path pathways to take over. So all these like cell death, ear stress, exosome release, and heat shock, protein 70 secretions, and CRT translocation, and ultimately moves toward that autoimmune response. So as you know, the vitiligo pathogenesis involves selective destruction of pigment producing melanocyte in the epidermis. So there's a data on this paralegal skin, they're showing uh, T cell melanocyte and T cell co-localizations and correlation exists between the paralegal T cell infiltration and melanocyte loss. So there is so many direct evidence of role of autoimmunity in vitiligo. So there are certain other abnormality which as I mentioned may impact melanocyte survival, hemostasis and adhesion in vitiligo skin. So all these factors finally contributing towards the immune pathways. So dermal abnormalities are also there, which has been documented. So this is very interesting. Like when we look at vitiligo, we just focus on melanocyte because we are looking for these melanocyte in the patch. But there are so many things happening in the patch apart from the melanocyte loss, creatinocyte defects, fibroblasts. So because these are very talkative cells, keep on talking with each other. So depend on each other for various growth factors, especially the melanocytes secreted by creatinocytes and fibroblasts. And it has shown that there are like multiple defects which uh, these growth factors, they are deficient. And finally, we know this alpha MSH has been tried based on this as a FMLNotide 60 milligram subtenous injection which can increase the rate of repigmentation or maybe uh, more a re a complete repigmentation when we combine it with the phototherapy. So as I mentioned about the other cells, so there are many other factors like here in this, there can be other non regenerative scan like keratinocytes and fibroblasts, they show defects like increase, it. there could be uh, decrease in KG keratinocyte growth factor or decov one We have also shown in our data the decov one in involvement and Finally, how they contribute towards probably ultimately our we move in that direction of autoimmune pathways. All of these could be so. These are still, I mean, far little uh, because we need to understand better, like how these uh, various things can be linked together, and if we can act early before the autoimmune full fledged autoimmune uh, pathway sets in. So Devinder, when I was growing up, my mom and dad were Indian immigrants, so they used to watch this movie, uh, Pati, Patni, or Wo. Wo kon hai? Yeah. How do you bring this all together? Yeah. Not to say that you're cheating on your wife, but what's all going on over here? Yeah. So I think still the Wo is missing here. So maybe a secret Wo, but uh, probably we need to know about that. That's important thing because that could be a connecting link between all these events. So as this was, I was mentioning throughout, so these are linked together. So how it starts and how it builds up and finally, because much more data is there, that final phase when we take a biopsy from a completely depigmented patch of maybe, or even, even the early vitiligo, how you call an early vitiligo when you see hypopigmentation, but it may not be an early vitiligo because the melanocyte loss will occur and sufficient number of melanocyte has been damaged and probably then we see but clinically some hypopigmentation or some that we call early vitiligo but it may be uh, many months before that that in vitro changes that T cells have started coming towards the melanocytes or so many cytokines were already there so melanocytes were being destroyed but at the same time getting repopulated from the outer root sheath. So probably when this cycle is disturbed, more of destruction, less of production, then this hypopigmentation develops. So early vitiligo may not be an early vitiligo. So that is why Dr. Samia's paper. So maybe we need an aggressive treatment even when we look at small uh, depigmented patch. 
So all of these things, they can be a hallmark of LIGO initiation and progression. So this is the major event of occurring here, the destruction by CD8 positive T cells with the concurrent NKG2 T and TCR single. So these are responsible for that. We know the final pathway. So here, how destruction is occurring. But we need to act even before that, what's happening before this final pathway. So this is important, like even you have seen that in non-segmental vitiligo of long standing, you have good repigmentation with maybe tacrolimus, with phototherapy, but again, patient can show a loss of pigmentation or even new patches. So why, once you repigmented it, so why then again, so we know there's persistence of that cell memories, CD8 positive DRAM cells, and probably this interleukin 15 and CD122 receptors are making them survive there, the CD8 positive DRAM cell. And the, uh, John Harris is, I think, working on blocking this pathway, either interleukin 15 or CD122 in a hope that it could lead to the lifelong stability. So this is what I call an exciting phase. And your presence and your commitment and your uh, devotion to this uh, participation make this testimony of this fact that this bit like go, this search is on the right path. So this is, yes, so here are we. So we have a lot of data. So finally, uh, what, I mean, we are using off-label most of the drug for bit like go, but we used to borrow from our understanding from treating psoriasis or alopecia areata. So based on that, we started using immunosuppressives like cyclosporine or other OMPs, steroids, but all are off-label use. And now, as we know, a few months back, there was first FDA approved. So probably now we, we are working toward that path, like for psoriasis. So in the near future, we will have many pharma participations where they will be working on these aspects and new molecules will be coming up. So this is a major pathway, the jack stat pathway, which could be responsible for interferon gamma, CXCL9, <coughs> CXCL10, damaging the melanocytes. If we act on this pathway, so we are definitely going to stop this damage against the melanocytes. But we need to know more about uh, other events before the development of this, the final destruction of melanocytes. So this interferon gamma and interleukin 15 signal through JAKSTAT pathway which drive the vitiligo initiation, progression and maintenance. So now we need to work on all these three different aspects. So these are very important, like initiation, progression and maintenance. Once we, we act early, so we can even stop the development of vitiligo. And maintenance is required for, as I mentioned, probably blocking that pathways of interleukin 15 CD120 receptor pathway. So direct deficiency in patient with vitiligo probably may allow evasion of energy by CD8 positive T cell. So there is interesting da data also that under normal circumstances, this T rex cell reduce proliferation and activation of these auto reactive effector T cells. So probably in vitiligo, these T rex cells may have reduced uh, homing capacity or activity and or reduced numbers, so which could be comparing the suppression of the CD8 positive T cell. So in a simple term, so it's a fight going on between good T cells versus bad T cells. So as of now, what we are doing with our broad spectrum amino suppressive, we are taking the cytotoxic or the bad T cells, whereas the future therapy could be if we can attract this T rex, the good T cells to the patch, which can be sort of guards against this melanocyte damage. So this would be a very interesting option, like one could be, I uh, have seen a paper by Khalid, I think, where they, shown, they, they have shown that CCL22 activation probably can attract these type of t rex cells toward the, uh, the patch or the skin, so probably can act as a guard against uh, these cytotoxic cells. So Devinder, you've done a good job of explaining how oxidative stress maybe dysbiosis links back into the immune system. And then you've talked about the different cell lines, keratinocytes targeted by interferon gamma, T regulatory cells targeted by IL-15, 
maybe expansion of normal T regulatory cells to avoid energy. But let's make this real. Let's make it practical for our audience, a smart group here. What's different about acral vitiligo? Why is that so difficult to treat? Yeah. And why is segmental vitiligo stable as compared to non-segmental? Yeah. So I think I'll go to that question straight away. These are already I discussed about the integrated models. So this is interesting, like we know like some of the patches over the acral part, so they are, even if we repigment, so they come back, and even it keeps on coming, the unstability is a hallmark of acral vitiligo. And uh, they, this was very interesting, the other factor may be contributing, so this is very interesting paper which was there in Nature, I think in the January or February, so where they have shown that probably uh, the fibroblasts might be player here because fibroblasts in the different area they behave differently and they have shown that they can augment or decrease the immune response. So as we were mentioning like other factors apart from melanocytes are important. So this, this is an interesting paper where they have shown that uh, when they have shown in this uh, original fibroblast from the acre area in a simple term make this immune attack multiplies many times so that they are difficult to treat such such areas and uh, there will be stability will not be established in such type of lesion with such a immune response against uh, the melanocyte. So probably we need more work because we know there are different subset which respond differently to the different treatment. Thank you. So you